Well, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, my name is Doug Malone. I'm the Director of Vehicle Operations and Curator here at the museum. And I've been with the museum since about 2019. And uh, I retired from the funeral business. And then I did this out of retirement because I love cars. I've loved cars since I was, ever since I can remember even opening my eyes. So uh, it's just been a dream position for me. So anyway, I'm glad you're here. I got interested in Route 66 um, just because I grew up with it. I can remember when I was a young man in the 60s, when we take vacations, we would travel Route 66. Of course, at the time, I had no idea what Route 66 was, and nobody really paid any attention to it back then, because that's just the only road that there was. A lot of people traveled it. They knew they had a good time. It didn't really become famous until the 80s, when it eventually uh, was decommissioned, and people started learning about it. I watched a television show one evening on TV about 20 years ago, and it was on Route 66. And I mentioned to my wife at the time, I said, you know, when I retire, I'd really like to get out and see if we can find that road again. She goes, well, she goes, it may not be around by the time you retire. We better start driving it now. <laughs> so about uh, the next year, we started driving little sections of it. I was on call at the funeral home, so we could only do like one week at a time where I could be away. So we couldn't do the whole trek at once. We started doing sections. The first summer that we went out, we had no idea what we were doing. Route 66 was not on maps. There was no GPS or navigation type things at that time. And I did find a book uh, that was pretty vague, but kind of took us down the track. So the first year we went out, we had a blast, but we missed probably 80% of what we could have seen that week. So I was finally able to find a book the next year that basically told you take exit 305 and go three miles this way and you'll see this. And what a tremendous help that was. Now today you can get GPS and apps on Route 66 that will just babysit your driving and take you right to where you need to be. And so it's, it's much more enjoyable. You don't have to try to figure out if you're on the right road or not to let you know. And a lot of the road today is marked too, either with an historic Route 66. Sometimes they paint the shit on the, the, the section of the road. And sometimes there's nothing there. And you may wonder, is this a goat trail? Is this Route 66? But uh, it's just fun to explore. So that's how I got interested in it. We did it over 10 years, my wife and I and my, my children when they were younger. We'd do a week at a time. And finally, we're able to get the whole route done. And we've done several sections more than once. So um, we just did a little bit of it last year, uh, this last summer with our granddaughter, Avery, who was with us. So she got a little bit of taste of what Route 66 was about too. So it's just a fun time to go out and, and revisit the past. So anyway, I'm glad you're here. And let's get going here. So why is Route 66 so endearing? Well, it was the first major route with good roadway that connected the rural communities with major cities. There were highways prior to that, like the Lincoln Highway and some other highways, but they were from big city to big city and they cut a very straight linear path. Route 66 was designed to connect rural communities with larger communities. So uh, that was a very, very productive road. It helped to make us more mobile society, getting people out. Uh, Lifeline to the Western, the Dust Bowl years, and we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. It was critical during the war effort during World War II in transporting military personnel and equipment. It was the catalyst in the formation of new communities and countless new family-owned businesses along the route, transport us to exciting vacation destinations, as a way for us to connect to our past, and a snapshot of American history. Now, Route 66 is about 2,448 miles long. And I say about because it has a lot of different alignments. It's changed countless times over the years. And some of the, some of the route only lasted a year or two before it was re realigned. Uh, but it was constantly changing, constantly evolving. But this is a number that it's been mostly uh, broadcast have been about 24 and 48 miles long. Most maps no longer include it. Now, I have found a few maps. And I'm talking about the old-fashioned paper maps that they do still make that will now have Route 66 with a little white shield on it uh, on some of the old roads. But uh, for the most part, maps don't have it anymore. Like we talked about a minute ago, you can find it on apps and navigation systems. It was commissioned in 1926, so it's 100th year anniversary is coming up here in just about four years, using as many existing roads as possible. It crosses eight states and three time zones, and Kansas is one of the fortunate states that, it's can that is cross. We have 13 whole miles of Route 66 in Kansas. Starts in Chicago and ends in LA, and I say it starts in Chicago and ends in LA because the reason we say that is because most of the traffic on Route 66 in the early days was from an east to west uh, direction. Um, and we'll learn more about that as we talk today. You can drive parts of Route 66 today. It's been replaced by interstates I-55, I-44, I-40, I-50, and I-10. It takes five major interstates to replace what Route 66 did at the time. 
A surprisingly mm -hmm. high amount of the old road is still out there waiting to be found. There's about 80% of the road still out there. You can drive most of that. It might be for a mile at a time before you have to get off, then reconnect with it a little bit further down the road. Some of it is on private property, so you don't have access to it. But a lot of it is still out there and drivable. It's known as the Mother Road, the Main Street of America, and the Will Rogers Highway. And we'll learn more about that here in just a little bit, too. It was also the name of a popular television series in the early 1960s called Route 66. Maybe a lot of you saw that back in the time. I was a little bit too young for that. Yes, I'm, I'm old, but I'm not quite that old. But I was born in 61. But uh, uh, Buzz and Todd would get in their Corvette and travel down the route and all kinds of adventures, and it was a really popular show. Uh, Cyrus Stevens Avery from Tulsa, Oklahoma, is noted as the father of Route 66. Then 1985 was officially decommissioned when it bypassed Williams, Arizona. So this is a gentleman that really got us going, Cyrus Stevens Avery. Now, Cyrus Stevens Avery was born in Pennsylvania, but when he was very young, they moved to Missouri. And uh, he was a school teacher and then later moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where he got into the well business, did very well, uh, later farmed. Uh, but he was passionate about finding better roads and better highways as our country was getting on wheels. And so he was on the Federal Highway uh, Association board. And uh, uh, through that association, and when the, the National Highway, Federal Highway Act of 1925 was formed, they were going to do a numbered system of highways. Before that, they were all named highways, the Lincoln Highway and, and the different various types of highway names. But uh, uh, in 1925, they decided they were going to do an inter or a national highway um, strategic plan, and they would be numbered. And east and west would be the uh, even numbers, and north and south would be the odd. Uh, and, uh, and that's what it still holds out today. So get your kicks on Route 60. Doesn't sound quite right, does it? Well, the reason I say that is because originally it was going to be Route 60. There's a lot of politics that goes into even Route 66, even clear back in the 1920s. And uh, when they were laying out the highways and figuring out the numbering, uh, the Route 60 was the number that came up. Well, there was already a Route 66 out east, and they were going to continue it on, but it was going to bypass Kentucky. Well, Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma were all in favor of Route 60. Kentucky was not. They wanted a, a, a zero number in their state because the major numbers were really the highways that had the prominence and brought people to their states. And so anyway, Kentucky won out. And uh, uh, so then uh, it was going to be called Route 62. 62 was still available. But Cyrus Stevens Avery said 62 just doesn't have any ring to it. So he looked and 66 was available. And so he selected Route 66 and it did catch on. So that's how it got to be Route 66 was through politics. Now this is the road route that the, it takes, and you can see it starts up here in Chicago. Now originally it was going to be a little bit more northern and go through most of Kansas and cut through that way. But you know, when your hometown is Tulsa, Oklahoma, which Cyrus Stevens Avery was, it's amazing how that really kind of took a deep dive down there. But it actually worked for the best because by doing so, uh, it averted the, the mountains and the weather was drier and the climate was better and warmer, so it made for better truck transportation and for public transportation, because the roads early on were not good roads, even when they started paving them. So it really was a good, good move. Like I said, connecting rural communities with major cities, helping farmers out and in, in, in different industries. Um, a little bit right there, Kansas, down by Galena, Baxter Springs. Now, how do we get going? We can really thank Henry Ford. Henry Ford was really the one that put America on wheels uh, with the Model T. Now, Henry Ford, as you all know, was in the auto business long before 1907 when the Model T came out, but uh, he had two failed businesses. And you can't think of him being a failure, but he was. He had, was with the Detroit Automobile Company and later the Henry Ford Automobile Company, which both did not succeed. Uh, when he sold out in 1902, uh, he was able to keep the Ford name, but nothing much else. And the, the old Henry Ford Actually, was bought out by um, Henry Leland, and it became Cadillac. So one of his early companies became Cadillac, a competitor of Ford. But in 1903, Ford started up the new Ford Motor Company and uh, started off with some. We got a 1907 Model R out there. It's one of his early cars. But he knew that if he was going to put America on wheels, he had to make the cars affordable. He had to make them durable and something that the farmers would like to use and could be used on farms and get the general public. So that's when he came out with the Model T. He also envisioned it as being a car that 
he would constantly try to get the price down. And that was what happened. In 1907, when the car came out, it was $895. When the last one rolled off the plant in 1927, it was $327. Now, how much can we think a car is going down in price over 18, 19 years today? And that does not happen. But Henry Ford made sure it happened. And with that, he made 15 million Model Ts over those years. Just amazing. But this is what we had to deal with. Now, we got these great cars. Now, in 1910, there were about 180,000 registered vehicles in the United States. Ten years later, there were 7.5 million. Think about that for a minute. What a change. But we didn't have good roads. And so we really needed to work on that. And Henry Ford knew if we didn't get better roads that not only his company but all automobile companies were going to get bogged down and not be successful. 1921, there are about 2.5 million miles of road with only 1% hard surface. A lot of them look like the picture we just saw. By 2021 today, we've got 4.1 million, or about 8.3 million lane miles with the majority of it paved. So that's how things have changed uh, since that time in 100 years. And here's a picture of some early pavement of Route 66 laying down. Now, some of the roads were, were uh, bricked early on. Some of them were paved. Um, anything that could hard service them. And it took from when Route 66 started in 1926 until 1938 to have the entire distance hard surfaced. And we can thank uh, President Roosevelt for his New Deal because he was the one that formed the, the CCC, the WPA, which put people in work on the roads for jobs and was able to get, get the road Route 66 paved. This is an early section out in Oklahoma. Uh, that was paved. Uh, this picture was taken in 1938, I believe. This bridge up here is a pony truss bridge, and it's still in existence. It's being threatened to be torn down. I hope it doesn't. But you can still drive across that. There's 38 of these Parker truss spans across a beautiful bridge. Uh, still, there's a lot of trees around there today. It doesn't look like this picture, but uh, a piece of that uh, or that road section is still drivable today. But it was one of the first sections in Oklahoma to be uh, paved. Now, about the time Route 66 was getting started, we had something that happened. We had the, the stock, stock market crash in 1929, and then we had the Depression, and then we had the Dust Bowl years. So not a great decade. A lot of people, especially rural farmers in Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, had uh, lost their farms to the, to the Dust Bowl, to the Dust Days. And uh, um, a book uh, that John Steinbeck came out with in 1939 called The Grapes of Wrath kind of summarized that life of that time and how how hard it was. And because so many people, about a quarter of a million people fleed from the Midwest out to California to find better jobs, most of them came back because there just weren't jobs out there, but they, they attempted it. But they didn't have any possessions, or you know, very few, they loaded them all up on their car, didn't have any money. They would caravan together, so if one broke down, they could help one another out. Um, it was a very nurturing road, and so, uh, John Steinbeck picked up on that and coined in his book calling it the mother road because people really did watch after, watch after each other and uh, didn't uh, uh, do anything to interfere with helping people out. So that's where the term the mother road comes of Route 66 was through John Steinbeck calling it that. A quick question, was that snow on top? I don't think so. I think it's just a tarp. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, it kind of looks like snow. This is a famous picture you've probably seen uh, by Dorothy Lange of um, hiking along or uh, hitchhiking along the route. And here's a great picture of these trucks caravaning together. See how they're all loaded up. Everything that they owned went with them. And of course, uh, there were a lot of no places to stay along the route at that time. There weren't the hotels or the the Hiltons or those kinds of things along the way. Nobody could afford them anyway, so most people just pulled alongside the road and camped out. And here's a photo of something that looked very common back in those days. There were some camps, campsites along the route where people would get together. Sometimes there were some showers and things like that. It was very primitive for all through the 1930s. Now, during World War II, Route 66 was very instrumental too. Um, when war broke out, uh, fortunately we had paved roads. They just finished paving Route 66 in 1938 uh, at the birth of World War II. And uh, we had to get a way to transport uh, people and military vehicles and things like this. 
It was quickly decided that uh, the West Coast was the primary spot for training of military soldiers due to the climate. And uh, so uh, a lot of soldiers, a lot of military people drove, drove Route 66 to go out there. There were a lot of military bases that were built along Route 66, uh, even as close as Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, right along Route 66. But uh, it was very um, useful during the war of transporting goods, materials, soldiers, and um, anything for the military effort. Now something else that hit during World War II that really affected people getting out and driving, which affected commerce on Route 66, was gas and tire rationing as well as other rationing. Uh, but the ones that impacted the automobile were gas and tire rationing. Now you would get a letter sticker for your car and it'd be like A, B, C, all the way up to X. Um, but A was the most commonly used gas ration. You'd get a sticker for your car, then you get a little coupon book that would allow you to get four gallons of gas a week. Once that, those four gallons were gone, you're out of luck. Um, now, if you had an X, you got unlimited gasoline. You know who got those? Politicians. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing's changed today. That's the way it works today still. But uh, uh, anyway, um, they also reduced the speed to 35 miles per hour. They call it the victory speed. If you slowed down, you can serve gas, and you can serve it on wear and tear on your tires. So that was enforced, really enforced. Um, there was a strong rubber shortage, and uh, uh, so you were allowed five tires per car. Uh, most, most people didn't even have one car, but if they had one car, they allowed five tires, and if you had more than that, they would confiscate them or you'd have to turn them in for the war effort. What happened, though, was that rubber, that old rubber really wasn't very good for the military purposes, they found out, but there was just no rubber to be had, so tires just could not be, you, they weren't making them. If you had to get new tires, if you were a physician or, or somebody that could get, get approval by the rationing board, then you could maybe get some new tires. But for most people, they had five tires that had to last them all through World War II. And so it was a tough time. But by get, rationing the gas and slowing the speed down and conserving um, helped all the war effort. Uh, something that was really amazing that our country did back then is pulled together. Everybody pulled together. It was a tough time for everybody. There was no complaints. Well, if there was, they were limited. People didn't put up with it. And uh, the country really pulled together and, and moved forward, which led to our success in winning, winning the war. Also something that stopped during the war was automobile production ceased. Uh, once war broke out in Pearl Harbor in December 41, uh, pretty much mandated right away they were going to stop automobile production. Chromium, which is already for chrome bumpers, which already uh, and hard supply to the our war effort uh, was strictly pro prohibited on vehicles. And by February of 1942, all public sales of automobiles ceased. Now between December and February, the cars came out with no chrome. And it uh, looks like, well, this is a military one, so it's pretty plain anyway, but, but this next one here, you can see this is called a blackout car. You can see that the chrome, they painted the chrome, what would have been the chrome and very limited trim. This might have at one time had a whole spear of trim down the side was eliminated. Anything to conserve metal uh, for, for cars. Only cars that were, any cars that were left over were set aside for the war effort for, for military use, for officers. Um, you could maybe get a car if you're a physician or something, but uh, that was even hard to do. Uh, there was no new cars being made. Everything, all the automobile plants turned over to military production of tanks and jeeps and airplanes and things like that. So can you imagine not being able to buy a car for you know, four or five years? Kind of feels like that right now. You can't really go out and buy a car. <laughs> but uh, at least we have, they're out there occasionally. But they didn't have a chip concern back there. But uh, they did have a, a metal problem shortage. Like I said, a lot of factories converted to, to war effort. Uh, Henry Ford built the Ford Willow Run air, uh, aircraft plant specifically for the military. It opened up in 1942, 3.5 million square feet. Can you imagine? Longest assembly line in the world at the time. Could build a B-24 bomber every 58 minutes. That is amazing. And it was said that even Hitler knew where Detroit was. <laughs> now, its heydays came after the war, you know. We had all these soldiers that drove up and down Route 66 and, and all the people that traveled during the Dust Bowl. And so it became a very common, very loved road. Well, after the war, people wanted to celebrate. They wanted to get out, they wanted to vacation. They wanted to enjoy, enjoy the things. And they'd been up and down Route 66. They saw the beautiful scenery. They saw what was out there. And so they took their families this time and 
about that time, Bobby Troop was coming back after the war um, on Route 66 and, and wrote the song Route 66, Get Your Kicks on Route 66. We've all heard that over the years, but that was by Bobby Troop, uh, recorded by Nat King Cole, uh, probably one of the most famous recording artists of it, but uh, still a popular song today, uh, especially for Route 66 enthusiasts. But we started seeing drive-ins pop up. Uh, prior to that, there were just restaurants you'd go and sit down, but people wanted to stay in their cars. So um, things like the Smells Drive and even things like McDonald's uh, flourished because of the automobile. We started seeing drive-in movie theaters. <laughs> a 57 Pontiac, imagine that. Um, but uh, a lot of movie theaters, and by about the late 1950s, there were over 4,000 drive-in movie theaters in the United States, and a majority, not a majority, but a lot of them on Route 66. And people just got in their cars and traveled, campers and and were very popular back then just to drive and see the country. I love this Shasta camper here. Steve Short, Steve's here, I think. He's got an awesome uh, air, Airstream, isn't here, Steve? Yeah. Um, but people just enjoyed getting out and traveling the road, and this is just a, a neat picture of what that might have looked like at the time. It all came starting to come down in 1956. Our president, Dwight Eisenhower, who had been a general and who had been who had witnessed so many things. And actually back in the early part of the, before Route 66 really got formed, uh, Eisenhower had gotten bogged down in the mud out of Fort Riley, which really upset him. He said, we really need better roads in this country. Well, then when he was in Germany, he saw the Audubon and that whole highway system. So this is what we need in the United States. We need a better interstate highway system. So in the Federal Highway Act of 1956 formed that. It was funded by the government for an, a complete revamping of our highway system. And uh, unfortunately, that bypassed all the old highways, and Route 66 was one of them that got bypassed, which was the death knell to Route 66. All the little communities and all the businesses along Route 66 relied on that traffic to, to support them. When that got diverted, even if it was just a couple miles off from where the old road was, people bypassed their communities, bypassed their businesses, which really uh, was the death knell to Route 66. In 1985, the last signs were taken down in Williams, Arizona. Uh, that's when that last town on Route 66 got bypassed by I-40, and this was a sad day. Even Bobby Troop flew out uh, for that decommissioning, and, and the one that had written the Route 66 song. So this is what you find today. Old sections of the road, sometimes they'll have a barricade across them. So you can't drive this anymore. This is I-55 in Illinois. Uh, I took this picture about 10 or 15 years ago, so it may be, this may be completely gone now. But we tried, when we drove it, we tried to capture as much of the old road as we could, not knowing how long it would be preserved. There are some preservation efforts out there, and a lot of it is being reconstructed and re resurfaced, but a lot of it's fading into history and will be permanently gone. Like I said, there's some old signs along the route. Here's some old sections here you can see. Now, this was just right outside of Barstow, California. We, I took this picture. Um, so you can still drive this. Um, the other highway that right up here that bypassed the route, but uh, we got off and we always tried to drive the route, even if it meant getting off for just a mile and getting back on. We wanted to drive as much of the, the route as we could at the time and just had a blast doing that. Sometimes you end up in a barricade or you drive along, all of a sudden there was a bridge gone. So you had to turn around and go back a long ways, but uh, it was an adventure. It was fun. We always tried to stay in the mom and pop hotels too. And, and sometimes that was a plus, sometimes that was a minus. <laughs> Uh, we stayed at some really nice ones. We stayed at some that you just wanted to scratch yourself all night. But we wanted to say that we'd stayed in them and experienced it because you didn't know how much longer they were going to be around. But I'll tell you, the people were always friendly. We never, ever encountered unfriendly people along Route 66. And you'd be surprised the number of people traveling Route 66 from out of our country. A lot of European travelers fly over, rent cars or motorcycles and do Route 66. You'd always run to somebody. Uh, maybe be a busload of um, people from overseas traveling the route. Always a fun trip. Always, always a blast. So we talked about lodging. We talked about early on there were just no really places to stay. And so you know, this is very common along the road. Now, that's, this definitely is not a, a fancy hotel today, but uh, it did protect them at the time. And uh, so that was very common along the road in 1920s earlier. Well, it didn't take long for people to figure out they could make money if they started providing lodging for people. And some of the earliest places were these little cottages that started forming or cabins. 
Um, this one was in Lebanon, Missouri, called the Nelson Dream Village. There were, I think, eight of these little cabins. Um, we have another picture of it here. Yeah, you can see here. Around the, there was a fountain in the middle, and no TV back then. So what happens is people would sit on the little porch and they'd talk to their neighbor, where are you traveling from, where you been? Just a real friendly type of atmosphere. You might go out sitting here by the fountain and talk to people. Um, little cabins, sometimes they had more creature comfort than their own homes did. Maybe they had in, in, indoor bathrooms, maybe not. No air conditioning or anything back there at the time, but uh, they were nice little cottages and they did very well. I found these back in 2002 when we were driving these outside of Oklahoma City. I just happened to notice them behind this chain link fence tucked back in there. I have no idea uh, what uh, motels, uh, cottages these were. I wanted, really wanted to hop over the fence and go back there and look inside them just to, just to explore, but one, I didn't want to get in trouble, and two, I hate snakes. And it looked like a good place for snakes, so I, I stayed over on the pavement. Now this is one, cabins eventually morphed into motels like you see here. This is a very famous one along Route 66 in St. Louis called the Coral Court. And uh, the cars uh, came up with this. I don't know if I've got a better picture, yeah. Actually, you could drive your car in, get out of your car and walk right into your room. People loved this, you know, they could, they could just not have to worry about the weather. Of course, as you can imagine, it also led to the trade of not being, you know, a little discreet. Uh, with uh, maybe a lady friend or undercover, under, you know, mob things, I don't know. But anyway, it's very popular, it did very well in the 1940s. They built it in 1941. Uh, unfortunately, it got to be uh, really run down by the late 1980s. It was torn down in 1995, much to the dis disappointment of the Route 66 Preservation Society. They tried to buy it, they won $1.5 million for the complex. and. They just couldn't come up with the money, so it did get destroyed. There was one whole unit that they took apart brick by brick that's now on display at the St. Louis Museum of Transportation. I understand they've got part of it at least put together. Uh, and were their plans are to put the whole unit together. So it is preserved a little bit up the road a little ways, but uh, kind of a famous part of this motel uh, has a little bit of a Kansas connection. Back in 1953, and maybe some of your older folks, I remember there was a young man, six-year-old boy out uh, named Bobby Lee Greenlease Jr was kidnapped from his school in Kansas City. Uh, his father was a very wealthy Cadillac dealer in Kansas City. And uh, when his son got kidnapped, they, uh, the kidnappers, a uh, uh, young couple, demanded $600,000 ransom for his safe return. Well, Mr. Greenlease uh, did not pay attention to the police who said don't pay the ransom. And he wanted his son returned back, so he did pay the ransom. Unfortunately, he didn't know that they'd already killed Bobby and buried him in St. Joseph, Missouri, then fled to St. Louis to try to avoid getting caught. Uh, they got the ransom money and they were finally caught in the Coral Court Motel in St. Louis, Missouri. When they found them, there was only half the money there, so they got $300,000 back. Well, for a lot of times there was rumor that the $300,000 was buried somewhere on the Coral Court property. So people always thought, and they thought even when it was still torn down in 1995 that it was still there. That's not the case at all. What happened was the two police officers that arrested them took the money, and they were later arrested and imprisoned for it. But um, uh, anyway, so that's a little history of a uh, Kansas connection to this Coral Court Motel. The Blue Swallow Motel in Tucumcari, New Mexico. Um, this photo we took in 2002 was getting a little bit run down. Uh, since that time, it's gone through several different owners. The current owners have really done a tremendous job of restoring the motel. We were just through there this last summer and I took some pictures, which I'll be some here at the end, uh, showing the little motel, but uh, it's really nicely done now and you can see that they've fixed it up, they've restored the neon. Uh, this was purchased um, by Mr. Redmond for his wife Lillian as an anniversary present back in the 1940s and Lillian ran this until she passed away in the 1990s. And then it's changed hands over the years, but Lillian just loved this place and uh, Lane and I stayed here about five years ago or so, I think it was, um, and that was one of the hotels. It was nice, but this, these owners hadn't taken over yet, and it still could use a little bit of work. But uh, we, we enjoyed staying there. We haven't been back since that time uh, to stay there. But one of the things I thought was fun is the, the rooms had rotary phones, and of course the old keys, but the rotary phones. And beside the phone was a little sign, how to use a rotary phone. <laughs> Now we, we laugh about that, but I have kids that come through here. I have no idea what a rotary phone is. 
And I have kids out here that don't understand crank windows. You know, that's, that's new to them too. So it's, it's just fun, the history that we, we learn. Um, things that we grew up with that we take for common, a lot of the younger generation doesn't know. And that's what's so fun about these places. It educates and it just shows the way of life the way it was. And I love these old motels and things like this really keep them period correct. And we stayed in some very nice ones. We stayed at a very nice one out in California. I can't remember the name of it. Um, there was a mid-century modern, 19, built in the 1950s. And they even had period furniture in the rooms. I mean, it was done, it was spotless. It was just really nice. Another little motel in Carthage, Missouri was the Boots Court. And here's what it looked like when it was built in the 1930s. Later, someone added a pitched roof to it, kind of took away the flare from it. It was really becoming seedy. It was a rent by the month type place. And in fact, when I took this picture, I believe, I had people, you could see them staring at me through the windows and you, know, you just kind of felt like you were gonna get gunned down any minute. So it wasn't very comfortable. Fortunately, someone bought it, two ladies bought it and completely restored it. They took the old pitch roof off, redid all the neon, restored the rooms. So today it's very nice. You can rent it again as a motel, or I think you can even rent some of the back of the units, I think are apartments that you can rent. But it's nice to see these places. Clark Gable, and uh, I'm trying to think who his bride was, um, her name. They stayed here on their honeymoon travels. So that's a little bit of notoriety with a movie star there. But um, Wigwam Village, this is a fun, you'd see these really, really unique things along Route 66. They tried to catch your eye so you would stop. You know, if you see something like this, especially if you've got a carload of kids, if they see teepees, you're staying there. You're not staying in the square box unit right beside it. You're going to stay here. And so these were built in the 1940s. And still, this one in Holbrook, Arizona is still owned by the same family. His grandfather built these. And the grandson now owns and operates it. And they're really pretty nice. We're still nicely done. We stopped through there, took some pictures this summer. When they're still there. They look like they've been well cared for. The parking lot was full of, of tourists staying there. This is what the inside of our room looked like. Dad? Yeah. Uh, there was a medical conference there about 10 years ago, I think. We stayed there. It was amazing. It was really quite nice. Yeah, they're fun, aren't they? Yeah. The only thing Martin they've added is TVs and an air conditioner unit in the wall but I mean even the furniture is the same furniture that, that his grandfather built back in the 1940s which is pretty cool uh, that's me standing outside of our unit uh, when we stayed there I kind of got a kick out of the bathroom because the, the mirror and the shower uh, you probably witnessed this too Steve was kind of canned so you're sitting there shaving in the morning kind of doing this <laughs> if you're if you've got some height to you but uh, they were fun I mean we just had a blast we always like I said we try to stay in these places and experience them I've got some old Super 8 movies that my parents took back in the 60s, and one of those movies shows them driving through Holbrook, and sure enough, there's a teepees and going alongside the road. So uh, I don't think we ever got to stay there when we were kids. I don't remember it. But uh, anyway, it was fun to see that in the movies. This is another one we stayed at in Lebanon, Missouri, called the Munger Moss, uh, kind of built in the late 50s. Very nicely kept. This is family owned and operated. Very, very friendly people outdoor pool and things and they have some rooms themed to Route 66. In fact, they put us up in the Route 66 room which had you no know, old pictures and stuff on the wall which is really fun. My wife made fun of me for taking one of these pictures coming up but uh, I, they just restored the neon when we were through there so I took this picture at night. Beautiful old neon sign. This is a picture my wife made fun of me taking but uh, I just thought this was so cool. 1950s porcelain and the blue and the coral colors and this bathroom was spotless. I mean, the tiles, like they'd just been laid. I mean, it was just immaculate. So you could tell it had been very well cared for. This is the thing I love, just reliving those times. I mean, there was nothing fancy here. There was no blow dryers mounted on the wall and no whatever today's motels have. I mean, it was very simple, but it just really get to experience what it was like at the time. Especially love when they're kept clean and really kept nice. This is a sad story here. We came across this one in 2002 in Groom, Texas. Groom is all but a ghost town. There's nothing there left. These were the two buildings that were there. It was this old motel. I think it was an old filling station, maybe a service court, maybe a cafe had been in there at one time. I couldn't really tell. Uh, this is now torn down and gone, so it's permanently gone. But uh, I took these pictures and captured that and uh, um, the result of the highway bypass in Groom, Texas. A little hotel we stayed at, motel I should say, in Sligman, Arizona, um, was the Route 66 motel. It just looks very simple. I mean, it's just a little rectangle strip building. Nothing fancy all about it. 
But the fun thing about it is on each of the doors, they had the movie stars that have stayed in that particular room. And they had a lot of movie stars that stayed there over the years because Seligman just happened to be a good spot for making Western movies and for filming. So a lot of Hollywood traveled out there, they needed a place to stay. And so back in the heyday of making those films, a lot of people stayed in these rooms. So it was kind of fun to know that I stayed in the same room as Timmy from Lassie, you know, or I had no idea who Glue Cal Gulliger was, but, uh, uh, but, uh, oh, okay, okay. So, but it was just kind of, that's fun to see. Now, Seligman, Arizona is just a great little community. Uh, there's a gentleman there by the name of Angel Delgadillo. I've met Angel a couple of times. And I'm really sick because I, I had some really nice pictures of him. Then I dropped my computer and lost them all when the hard drive cracked. <laughs> save your, save your stuff on the cloud. But um, um, anyway, Angel was the one that really got the preservation of Route 66 started when, when I-40 bypassed Seligman. He had a little barber shop there in town. He said it was like someone just flipped the light switch off. The traffic just stopped. That little town was all but going to dry up. Well, Angel didn't like that. He said, no, this has been such an important road. We really need to reach out and see what we can do to preserve this road and get people to stay on it and to see it. So he's really kind of the, what I'd call the father of the preservation of Route 66. He started off in Arizona, then other states took up with it. He is still alive. I think Angel's in his mid-90s now. We stopped there through the, this summer and hoped to see him, but he wasn't at his barber shop that day, so I unfortunately missed him. But uh, that little town's still pretty vibrant. You know, it's got a lot of Route 66 traffic. And you'd be surprised how many people get off the main road to drive Route 66 today, which is really keeping these, these old businesses alive and well. gas station. We're talking about the Phillips Petroleum Company. Um, started in the 1920s down in, in um, uh, Oklahoma. And uh, we've heard now it's called Phillips 66. Well, Phillips 66 got its name from a type of gasoline that Phillips Petroleum was coming out with in the 1920s by the time Route 66 was being formed. And uh, this high test gasoline, well, they were testing the gasoline down in Oklahoma. And uh, one of the so the story goes, is one of the uh, uh, persons in the car goes, man, we are going 66 miles an hour. I can't believe we're going that fast. you got to imagine this is 1920, so 66 was pretty fast. And the guy says, yeah, we're on Highway 66. So, hey. And then it turns out the gravity of that fuel was 66, whatever that means. But I read that the gravity of the fuel was 66, too. So between those three things, they said, well, Phillips 66 was a good name for it. Well, the first Phillips 66 gas station that was opened up in the United States happens to be in Wichita, Kansas. It still stands. Uh, this is a picture of it. I haven't actually physically been, been by it. I took this off the internet, but uh, uh, the first one in the United States was in, in Wichita. The little gas station started popping up all over the country. Uh, this gentleman, Ray Dietz, down in Border, Texas, had a gas station, but he, he knew that he could do something more. And you got to think of the, engine, in, the mindset of these guys. I mean, he, he got this 1964 Econoline van and customized it with gas, air, oil, anything you might need, fan belts, and drove up and down the highway looking for stranded motorists. And he would, he would assist them, you know, if they had help. And then he'd give them his card. So lo and behold, if they were on a trip, when they'd come back through that community, Borger, they'd probably stop at his regular service station because he stopped and helped them when they were stranded on the highway. Really helped him build a good business. And he was very well known along the highway. But just the ingenuity of you know, designing something like that and building it and putting it together and, and uh, I think it's pretty cool. Certified clean restroom, something that we need today. <laughs> Very badly. But Phyllis Petroleum figured out people will stop to use the restroom and if you've got clean restrooms, they're gonna stop at your station and more likely buy gas and other things. So they came out with what they called highway hostesses. They would go up and down the highway, they would inspect the bathrooms and if you had a clean bathroom, you get a certified clean restroom sign to hang in your window, which would draw motorists off the road to use your facilities and buy gas. So uh, they did that for a number of years. I think that's just a pretty cool thing. Never happened today, but uh, uh, back then that was a way to keep the restrooms clean. This picture in the 1960s just kind of shows a full service station, how they morphed, started doing little vendoramas. Later they would have sometimes have little restaurants connected to them. But here you'd have a service tenant come out, someone's cleaning your window, someone's filling up your gas. Um, I can't see what the price of the gas is, but I'm sure it's not $4. <laughs> but uh, this is a 1963 car, I think. So, uh, but uh, just a cool snapshot of what stations were like. 
This little station in Mount Olive, Illinois, was owned by the Soulsby family. Uh, he's now deceased, but the little station has been preserved. Uh, it's very well uh, kept and maintained. Just a fun place for a photo op. Same with this one in Odell. This station, we came through there in Chandler, Oklahoma in 2002. They're right over here, you can't see it. There was a Century 21 sign that this was for sale. I thought, oh no, you know, this is going to be torn down. We're going to lose this. And uh, we went through a couple years later, and the wrecking ball was there, and there, this was just a bottle of rubble. I thought, oh, darn it. Well, this little building was still there. I happened to talk to somebody, and they said, oh, no, no, no. The city bought it, and they're just, they wanted to restore the 1920s. This was out in the 60s. So they took the 60s thing down, and we're going to leave this. I thought, well, that's cool. Then I saw what they did with it. <laughs> they painted it this hideous color. Now, I've been told that that was what it was. Now, I know that this was never that. You just can't get to that. But uh, um, anyway, at least it's still there um, and preserved. This station in uh, Shamrock, Texas, built in 1938, very Art Deco. That was the Art Deco period. And the gas station was down here, a little you drop in cafe down here. Very popular space. This is Route 66. We stopped through there in 2002. And there was a sign right here. And you can see me reading the sign. It said, being restored summer of 2002. Well, I was there in July and there was nothing going on. So I thought, okay, this isn't going to happen. They didn't get their funding. This is going to be torn down or nothing's going to happen. Well, lo and behold, they did get it done. They restored it. And uh, this is now the Chamber of Commerce office. They redid all the neon. The little old little cafe that was connected there it was all refinished. It's no longer a restaurant, but you can rent it out for meetings. Uh, so civic groups or, or family reunions or whatever can rent it out, which is really a cool use of the building. So nicely redone, nicely repurposed. This launching pad cafe in, in, uh, in Bloomington, Illinois, has seen some ups and downs. It originally was a Dairy Delight uh, ice cream place. In the 1960s, they changed the name to Launching Pad because of the whole space race thing. Um, very popular place. They bought this Gemini giant statue and custom fitted it to look like an astronaut. This thing, I don't know how tall it is. We can see by the motorcycle how, in the car how tall it is. Right there on, ice, or on 66 Highway. So the kids, here again, the kids, I want to stop, I want to stop. Pull in and look at the Gemini giant. You're more likely going to go in and buy a milkshake and a hamburger. So it served really well. The Gemini giant is still there. The place did close down about 10 years ago and sat empty for about five years. They couldn't find any buyers for it. Finally, they did find a young couple who happened to meet both their spouses had passed away to cancer. They somehow got together and they had some kids, older kids, but uh, kind of like the Brady Bunch thing, you know, they kind of got together. But uh, they were driving up and down Route 66, both kind of either close to retirement or having some money. They had this passion, they wanted to restore something. They bought the launching pad about five years ago, completely restored it back to its original 1960s grandeur. It's still called a launching pad. It's got a little museum attached to it. Uh, wonderful food. And the Gemini Giant they restored. So it's just fun to see these places uh, that are preserved by people who are passionate about keeping Route 66 alive. Ted Drew's another famous place along Route 66. Uh, Ted Drew's actually started in 1929 in Florida. They moved to St. Louis sometime, I believe, in the 1940s. But this one on Chippewa a Boulevard, which is Route 66, has been there since 1941, I believe. And uh, they serve frozen custard. They're famous for little wood icicles and stuff. But Ted Drew's, if you drive by there on a typical summer night, there might be 50 people in line at the windows. They have like 12 windows. People are just backed up to buy Ted Drew's frozen custard. And so we've stopped there a couple times when we've been through St. Louis. Uh, just a real famous landmark along Route 66. And it's still owned by the same family, uh, the grandson or the granddaughter's husband and the granddaughter own it now. This place, the Diamonds in Villa Ridge, Missouri, used, this used to be Route 66 right here. I uh, later was bypassed and then this little restaurant. Uh, this at one time was the largest enclosed air conditioned restaurant on Route 66, very famous on the road. They later built little cottages behind for people to stay. Of course, when the highway got bypassed, it went to disrepair. Uh, the building does still stand. It looks like this now. They use it for auctions and things like this. I haven't been by there in a couple of years to know what's going on with it now. I always hope that someone would buy this and restore it back to its grandeur. But I doubt that it'll happen because it's just too far off the road. But who knows? Who knows? Chain of Rocks Bridge in St. Louis, one of my favorite places to visit. 
because of the uniqueness of it. It has a 22 degree bend in the middle of it. Uh, now you can imagine, you know, driving along and all of a sudden you have to turn sharp left or right depending on which way you're going. It's a mile across the bridge. When it was first built in the 19, uh, late, early 19, or 1920s, I guess, it was a toll road. In uh, 1928, it joined Route 66 as a St. Louis bypass highway of Route 66. Um, the bridge was closed down in 1966 or 68, I can't remember what year for sure, uh, for driving across and it was closed and it sat deserted for a number of years. Really got into bad state of disrepair. In fact, there was actually two young ladies that were murdered out on it back in the 1980s or 90s. So it was, they were going to try to tear it down, but it cost too much money to tear it down. And so for that reason alone, it got preserved. Well, in the 19, late 1990s, it got bought by Trailnet, who was a biking trail uh, company, and it's now reopened for pedestrian traffic. Once a year or twice a year, they let cars drive across, like for a car show or something. But it's really well preserved, and you can walk out across it. My problem with it now is the crime rate in this area is just terrible. When we first visited, you could park your car down here, not worry about it, and walk across it and walk back. We went by a few years later and this sign said, you know, watch your car, you're being watched, you know, for vandalism. And so we got a little bit hesitant. Well, we were through there, what, two years ago, I think, or three years ago. This side was completely closed. They wouldn't even let you park there anymore because of the crime. You had to go across the Illinois side and park. You can see these surveillance cameras up there, but there are signs all over the place warning you that you're being watched. Don't, you know, watch yourself. Didn't make it real comfortable walking out there. But uh, which is really, really unfortunate. I wish they'd have some better um, uh, police uh, help to help with that, get it back where it needs to be. But anyway, the bridge is still there. And you can see it, the new Chain of Rocks Bridge runs right along, I guess, Highway 470, runs right beside it. This is an early photo of it. The reason for the bend, I should say, you can kind of see right here where there's a little bit of rippling in the water. There's a layer of rock right there. And so there was one little area that barges and boats could get through without getting hung up on the rocks. Well, in order to be able to clear that, where the bridge abutments went, they had to angle the bridge so the bridge abutments would open up that track. So that was the reason for the bend in it, uh, to keep the boats from getting hung up on the rocks. In the 1960s, they bypassed it with a channel over on the Illinois side. Uh, to completely go around it. But the original reason for the bend was because of that chain of rocks right there. These little intakes here are still there. They're built in the 1800s. And that was for the water supply for St. Louis. Uh, were used for decades. In fact, they may still be in use in some aspect. I don't know. They were up about 10 years ago. I don't know if they still are. But really cool architecture in those little intake towers. This little section of the road is in the Route 66 Park right uh, south of St. Louis. Uh, I took this picture. We stopped there. I took this picture. And I wish I had taken one more picture a little bit. Maybe it was back this way. I can't remember. There was a sign that said dead end. And I didn't think anything about it. We drove down there. Sure enough, it dead ended. But you know what's at the end of this road? A cemetery. <laughs> I thought, thought, well, how appropriate. It's called dead end. And at the end is a cemetery. But um, this one, the first section of the Route 66 to be four lane. This is in Lebanon, Missouri. It was four lane because of Fort Leonard Wood, which is stationed not too far from here. Uh, this is an example of early Route 66 four laning. What's unique about this is the curbs, even on the side of the little beveled edges on the on the highway. You don't see that on highways today for safety reasons. Of course, that's what would happen is the car would hit that and flip the car over. So it's very dangerous. But uh, four laning for use of military traffic to speed speed traffic up, getting military transport out. You can kind of hardly see it now, but there's huge. It's kind of overgrown with green now. But that's a huge rock that they had to cut out. When they did this back in the 1940s, that was very difficult to do. It took them a year to cut through that, that spot there. Um, but uh, you can still drive that. In fact, the, when I took this photo, we just happened to get off per our guidebook, you know, take this exit to get on the road, which we could see this. But we just gotten off of I-44, which was backed up for miles with road construction. But we got on this little stretch right here and we drove for, I don't know, five, 10 miles and avoided that whole construction thing, got back up on the highway. And that was like 25 yards on the side of these trail. All those people lined up only knew there was a four lane highway <laughs> just a matter of yards away they could get on. Of course, the state didn't want people driving on that for safety reasons, but we, we just skirted right around, it was great. This little section of highway down in Oklahoma, known as the Ribbon Highway, 
um, is still in existence. You can drive us about three and a half miles of just nine foot wide lane traffic. Well, back in the 1930s when they were paving, states were given so much money to pave. Well, Oklahoma figured out if they just made the road a little bit narrow, only paved one lane, they'd go twice as far with their money. So that's what they did. You know, the cars, you know, the little Model Ts and stuff weren't very big. And if you came up to somebody, you just pull off and let somebody pass you. Uh, so it worked out really well. But you can still drive this and see it. Don't take a nice car down there, they'll tell you. There's a lot of potholes and it's pretty rough. We were pretty much j run jagged by the time we got off of it. But we drove it. It was fun. Yeah, it's uh, just an early example of early road that was built even before Route 66 came into being. <clears throat> This little Rainbow Arch Bridge down Riverton, Kansas this is the last Rainbow Arch Bridge on Route 66. Uh, really a cool little bridge. You can still drive across it. You have to take a little exit road to go across it. It goes across Brush Creek, but last of this architectural design for the bridge. Merrimack Caverns is a fun place to stop along Route 66. Uh, Lester Dill, who owns the, and it's still owned by the same family, the Dill family, but back in the day, Lester Dill owned it. And Lester came up with the idea of penning uh, signs on the side of barns. He was the one that kind of instigated that. And so you drive up and down I, uh, or on Route 66, see Merrimack Caverns signs on barns all over the place for states away. And really did well for, for advertising his museum. And uh, it's a cool little museum down on the Merrimack River, uh, still in use today. I found this little atomic shelter ticket on the eBay and I bought it. So I thought it was so unique that it kind of did a snapshot of time I'll read it to you if you can't read it. It says, this, this will be the ticket you get when you went into the museum after you paid the entrance. But it says, having entered the famous Jesse James Jungle Room of Merrimack Caverns, the bearer whose signature appears hereon has been made a member of the Merrimack Caverns Atomic Bomb Shelter Club. As such, the holder is entitled to utilize the facilities of Merrimack Caverns as a shelter during an atomic bomb raid. <laughs> How comforting is that? But you know, that's, that's 1950s. A little fun place, very famous, along with the Blue Will in Catoose, Oklahoma. This was built in 1974 by Hugh Davis for his wife Zeta, who loved whales. And they had this little pond on their property, and he built this huge well as a swimming, uh, has a diving board off the tail and little slides. Well, the problem was it was so close to Route 66 that people going along the road would pull off to look at it and would start using it without permission. Well, Hugh thought, well, if I'm going to be using this, I might as well make some money out of it. So he opened it up to the public charge admission. And so for a number of years, it was used uh, as a little picnic area and people could get out and swim there. Then it kind of got into disrepair and like most things at the time and the pond got full of sludge and stuff. So uh, it got closed down. The, the well is still there. It has been restored a number of times. Still looks really good. You can walk out on it. Uh, it's just a fun little place to, to stop and see. Just some ingenuity here again. Little old Riverton store in Riverton, Kansas, built in 1925, so a year before Route 66. Still owned and operated uh, continuously. Oldest business on Route 66. You can buy little sandwiches in there. It's a little, like a little grocery store. Also, it's a souvenir shop, obviously. It's also the headquarters for the Kansas Route 66 Association, now owned by Scott Nelson, who I think is a grandson of the original uh, family. Big Round Barn in Arcadia, Kansas, built in 1898. This is Route 66. You can't miss this, it's so huge. The fascinating thing is you can go in and tour this. You walk up here and they hold dances in here and you can see why. This huge area, and I can't describe how huge it is, there are no support beams coming down. It's all one dome, dome framed. And how they did that in 1898 is just amazing to me. But a fun place to stop and see along the route. Of course, there's other things for tourists like the Painted Desert and the Petrified National Forest along the route out in Arizona. Drive-in movie theaters. This one in Carthage, Missouri is still open today. It had a period of about five years where it was closed, but it reopened. And it's run by a young couple that uh, really restored it nicely. Even the little ticket booth out front still has the original glass block on it. And uh, you can get in. On, it's open on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday during the, during the warm weather, spring and summer months. Uh, for shows. You don't hang a little speaker on your car anymore. You turn your FM station, tune it in to hear the to hear the movie. But uh, it's still a fun little place. It's still open. One of the last survivor drive-in movie theaters along Route 66. One of the biggest ones was the Azusa Foothill Drive-In Theater. It opened in 1961. 1,510 car capacity. Can you imagine that? 
Uh, it was closed in 2001. They tried to preserve it, but unfortunately it got torn down. It's now a parking lot for the university there. But they did preserve the sign. The sign's still there. And it's, the neon and stuff still works on it, but unfortunately the movie theater is gone. Of course, we all know the movie Cars, or at least car guys know about the movie Cars. Fun one the kids. Uh, in fact, we got Doc Hudson out here, I like to call her Hudson, Doc Hudson. But it was filmed in 2006. Uh, the Pixar people traveled up and down Route 66 to get ideas for the movie. And uh, one of the things that they came across uh, for inspiration for Tomator, and they found the inspiration for that in Galena, Kansas. There's a little gas station right here, and this truck was back in the field. The hood was off of it, kind of just in disrepair over there, and they just fell in love with that truck. So that became the inspiration of Galena, Kansas. Well, the truck is still on exhibit there right at the corner of Route 66. We turned to going to Galena. And um, I happened to be through there the day that the president of the Kansas Association was there and let me sit in it to get my picture taken, which is pretty cool. But uh, now they've got a fire engine and another truck kind of be with the cars thing out there too. And they've really restored that nicely. Uh, so it's just fun to kind of see where some of that movie inspiration came from. A little Budville Trading Post in Budville, New Mexico still stands today. Um, uh, Bud Nell Rice, who owned this, was uh, kind of a rascal. Um, he kind of definitely had two sides to him, from my understanding. Is, uh, one, he had this little business. He was also the Justice of the Peace. He had the tow business and was kind of uh, the, the inspiration behind the, uh, what do you call them? I'm trying to think. I'm drawing a blank now. The place where the cops were always sitting there waiting to catch you with their, with their speed trap. Uh, he'd catch a lot of speeders and haul them in and get money from them. And, He'd tow him into the, his little filling station here to fix the car and, and charge him an out, outrageous price. And anyway, uh, the story goes, uh, you know, whether it's just folklore or not, but it's a good story either way. It was family pulling there to get their car fixed. The fan belt had broke on and he put a new fan belt on it, presented him with the bill and they thought it was a little bit too much. They reached out with a knife, cut the fan blade off and told him to push the car off and start charging him a storage fee. So that's the kind of guy he was. But the flip side of the man is apparently he gave very heavily, did very well, but he donated very heavily to children's activities and supported kids' projects and things. So it was a nice side to him. In 1965, him and his um, co-worker were found murdered <laughs> inside this little trading post. So someone, they apparently cut a fan belt off of that didn't like it. But um, anyway, <laughs> that's the story of that. This little jackrabbit trading post in, in Joseph City, Arizona is still there. Uh, they're famous for their Here It Is sign. All along Route 66, you see these black, black and yellow signs they have a mileage like 1,800 miles, 500 miles, 3 miles. And when you finally got there, it said, Here It Is. Just a really good public relations advertising thing to get people to look. Come this little tiny hole in the wall um, uh, trading post, which is really cool. On the outside, it looks kind of, I don't know, not too sure. But you walk inside, it's the most fun place. All kinds of souvenirs, Route 66 memorabilia. For years, they had cherry cider. That was kind of their famous thing. I've been there four times. They've never had any cherry cider. So I don't know if they just no longer do it or, or what. But um, I keep missing on that. But just a cool place. It's still in existence. And of course, in a line, Santa Monica Pier out in Santa Monica. Um, it's what's officially the end of the road, even though it's actually about two blocks away from the Santa Monica Pier, but uh, that's when you reach the end of the Route 66. So thanks to the interstate highway system, it was now possible to travel across the country from coast to coast without seeing anything. <laughs> from the interstate, America's all still guardrails and plastic signs and replaced looks and feels and sounds and smells like every other place. Charles Corral. Cars today, they all look alike. We all know this, you go to a car, they're all black or white or gray, the interiors are all black or white or black or gray or brown, they're very boring. And the highways that we travel on, cars of Route 66, and the highways these cars traveled on. This is in Missouri. This is in California. Or, I'm sorry, uh, Arizona. I took this picture right outside of Groom, Texas, uh, right where that old, remember that route, that 66 Courts Hotel that was falling apart? It was right back in here. This was right, sun's getting ready to set. I thought that was so pretty. 
and you'll find some. This is in Missouri. So what's the future Route 66? Well, it's doing well. You have new businesses popping up, like this Pop 66 in Arcadia, Oklahoma. It's been open now for at least 10 years. Uh, it's all solar operated. Uh, they serve all kinds of pop. They have this giant neon pop bottle out front. You can buy sandwiches and get gas and things in there. That's in, this is in uh, Oklahoma. Back about five years ago, they were trying to get uh, a trial of solar panels on roads, and they're going to do Route 66, a section of Route 66. Uh, the people that were coming up with this idea thought that uh, the solar panel one would not only produce enough energy to uh, save money to pay, pay the roads, but also the heat generated from these would keep the ice and snow off of them. Um, but for one reason or another, they decided not to do Route 66, I just found out and moved it to another state. So I don't know how these are going, but it's a pretty cool idea that they're gonna originally try this down in uh, just south of St. Louis. And then we just stopped through Tucum Carry this summer, and lo and behold, you find electrical charging stations on in the old hotel, uh, near the old hotel parking lot. So there is still life out there, and they're changing to adapt to the time. A lot of travelers on Route 66, uh, so they're trying to accommodate them whatever way they can. This neon sign, or not neon, but lit, lit sign in Tucum Carry, kind of a cool little motif. So we're still strong. We just took these photos this summer. Here's that Blue Swallow Motel. Here it is. Sign. The neat thing about that is the same boards on this sign as were put on in 1949 when it was built. They paint it and keep it fresh, but still has the same original boards on it. This Roadrunner Motel in Tucum Carry, really nicely restored. A little 1962 Rambler parked underneath the overhang. This uh, hotel in uh, uh, Gallup, New Mexico, uh, the El Rancho, a lot of movie stars stay there. They're getting out there for filming, beautifully maintained. So there's a lot of things, old things preserved and new things coming up. So uh, Route 66 is strong and doing well and more and more people travel all the time. So I think it's going to be around for a long time. Officially decommissioned in 1985, however, the road is, did not die. A resurgence of energy is finding the old highway. The travelers not only from the United States, but throughout the world traveling the old route to find the magic of yesteryear. I believe that everyone should take a break from their hectic day of lives and travel historic Route 66. It will open your eyes to what America is all about, who we are, where we came from, and what we should be striving to preserve. Capture the magic is still out there. And that's the end of my presentation. Questions? Yeah. 59, well, what the army we left Indianapolis by bus, crossed the chain of rocks bridge, and the, every bus full of new recruits from Fort Leonard would have stopped at the diamonds. Oh, yeah. So you got you got to see that. It's when, the only place to stop. Was it pretty cool? It was cool. Yeah. I've been on a lot of uh, Route 66 west, but never, never, east, never east of Joplin, I don't think, on it. But... Uh, you didn't talk about that either. What about the eastern end? Is there anything in Chicago still? Or what, what's there is. Uh, there is a lot of to, to see in Illinois. Um, I don't have a lot of pictures of Illinois. Um, that was one of the early treks that we did before we had good, good navigation. But uh, some like that standard gas station was in Odell, Illinois, and like the Sulsby's and stuff. But there are some some restaurants um, in Chicago that are very famous along Route 66, which is Michigan <coughs> Avenue is Route 66. Um, but uh, yeah, I would just suggest if you're really interested in Route 66 is to, just to go on and do some research about it, uh, get some books and learn what's out there. And you can do them state by state or even city by city, the bigger cities, and find out what's still in existence or maybe it's called something different now, but you can walk by and still see what the old building looked like. Um, but yeah, there's a lot in every single state to see, and, and more and more states are getting on board with bringing it to everybody's attention. What they have is growing more popular. Uh, I think one of my favorite areas has to be the Southwest, just because of the difference in the topography, the landscape, and, and uh, just some of the fun things out there that I don't see every day here in Manhattan. But uh, Missouri is also beautiful. I mean, that winding road, the Merrimack Caverns, and some of the old hotels and stuff. So. It, there's always something fun to see, no matter what you can do of it. Could you talk about the alignment of Route 66? I noticed on the map that Albuquerque to Santa Fe, it seems like uh, there's competing routes in that. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, let me see if I can get back to that, if I can. Yeah, well, I think Ron's talking about this little uh, bump up up here to Santa Fe. And this was a part of Route 6. Originally, Route 66 went down through here, then went up to Santa Fe, then dropped back down to Albuquerque and came around. This little part here wasn't there. That was like two or three years that that was part of the route. Well, here again, this is politics that came into play. And I don't remember what, if it was governor or representative or what, there was some um, political race that was taking place and the headquarters for the guy that was wanting to win was based out of Santa Fe. Well, the guy that was competing against him, um, they didn't get along, it wasn't one friendly. Well, the guy in Santa Fe won the race and the guy that didn't win didn't think they played fair. So while he was still in office, he got Route 66 bypassed away from Santa Fe down down this way and uh, really ticked off this guy because you know by the time the guy got put into office, it was all under, underway. But things moved a lot faster then as far as uh, getting things passed and moved forward. But uh, so that's a was a political thing. Everybody wanted to go through their town. I had a similar experience to you going through. I was coming back from Arizona on Interstate 40 and my Google Maps started chirping that the highway was wrecked because I just dove off the exit, went up off, the, ended up, I was on Route 66. Yeah. And I was driving along, you know, well, this is cool. I stayed on it for a while until I think it disappeared. And then I had to get back on the interstate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was just one of those fluke things, so. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun to drive, it really is. That one of those last pictures that you showed that motel in the center had a car, you know, there. Mm -hmm. What was that Ford? It was a 62 Rambler. 62 Rambler. We stayed, in, we stayed in one where there was a Ford down in front of it, I think. <laughs> Thunderbird or something like that. That's a nice. Some of that, some of those towns are really, really up to scale. I mean, they're, they're neat. Yeah, some of them are really neat. Some of them, like Holbrook, where those TP hotel is, Holbrook is needing some some help. You know, they're they're struggling financially, but uh, the teepees are still there. The cool thing about the teepee hotel is the owners have parked an old classic car in front of each teepee, so a period period car. So there's still room for you to park your car, but there's going to be a classic car right out in front of it, which kind of gives a <laughs> little fun vibe to the to the teepees. The old Rambler is still there as of a month ago. Did you see it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, just, I wanted to ask the guy more about it, but I never could find anybody to ask about it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice little car too. It's very well done. Yeah. It's my understanding that there were uh, six TP hotels built across the country. One of them is still standing at, uh, near Bowling Green, Kentucky, not on 66. And uh, we've stayed at two of them. We've stayed in Holbrook and we've stayed at, uh, what is it, San Bernardino, California. Mm -hmm. The San Bernardino one has been kind of over modernized and it does not have the classic furniture but uh, it still has the funky little bathroom with the tiny shower that's in the slope of the wall yeah. you can barely get in there and the shower hits you i'm only five foot six and the shower hits me in the chest yeah yeah <laughs> yeah the one is fun no i know the one you're talking about we went by rialto i think is where it is but uh, they're in san Bernardino. yeah it's got palm trees outside too instead of right. sagebrush <laughs> Oh, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, Steve. Yeah, the, the TP hotel we stayed at was in Goodyear, uh, Arizona. So it was in a different town of Holbrook. So Goodyear, Arizona. I didn't know there was. Yeah, Huh. Interesting. Other questions? Well, thank you all again for coming out. I enjoyed having you.